the enigma of Nazi wonder weapons, known as Wunderwaffen in German, continues to captivate history enthusiasts and the public. The sheer magnitude of these technological marvels, coupled with their sci-fi-like aspirations, has cast a spell on the perception of Nazi technological superiority during World War II. This notion, amplified by video games, often portrays the Nazis as pioneers in cutting-edge weapon technology compared to their allied counterparts. Embarking on a journey into the surreal, this video unveils some of the most extraordinary weapons deployed by the Nazis during the war. Brace yourself for a dive into the absurd realm of projects like the Sun Gun and Tornado Cannon, creations so fantastical they border on fiction. Stay with us until the end to unravel the impact of these so-called wonder weapons on the war and whether they posed a genuine threat. Schwerer Gustav, translated as Heavy Gustav, emerged as a testament to German engineering prowess during the late 1930s. Crafted by Krupp in Rügenwalde, this monumental 80cm railway gun was specifically conceived as siege artillery, with a singular focus on obliterating the formidable main forts of the French Maginot Line, then considered the most robust fortifications in existence. Weighing an impressive 1,350 tonnes when fully assembled, Heavy Gustav could unleash 7-ton shells with pinpoint precision, achieving a remarkable range of 47 kilometers. Conceived in preparation for the Battle of France, Schwerer Gustav missed the opportunity to see action during that conflict. The swift and dynamic blitzkrieg through Belgium by the Wehrmacht outmaneuvered and isolated the static defenses of the Maginot Line, rendering Gustav's intended role obsolete. Instead, Conventional heavy guns laid siege to the Maginot Line until French capitulation. Schwerer Gustav found its operational debut in the Soviet Union during the Battle of Sevastopol, a crucial episode of Operation Barbarossa. Notably, the colossal rail-mounted gun demonstrated its destructive power by obliterating a munitions depot positioned approximately 30 meters below ground level. Following this, Gustav was relocated to Leningrad, potentially earmarked for deployment in the Warsaw Uprising, a fate never realized due to the uprising suppression before preparations were complete. Schwerer Gustav's historic significance is unrivaled, representing the largest caliber rifled weapon ever employed in combat. While surpassed in caliber by the unused British Mallets Mortar and the American Little David bomb-testing mortar, both at 36 inches, Schwerer Gustav remains distinctive as the only one among the three to see combat. In February 1942, Heavy Artillery Unit E672 embarked on a significant march, transporting Schwera Gustav to Crimea. The sheer scale of this endeavor was staggering. The gun's arrival at the Perikop Isthmus marked a pause until a special railway spur line was constructed 16 kilometers north of the target. The siege of Sevastopol witnessed Schwerer Gustav's baptism by fire. The immense effort involved 4,000 men, with an additional 500 men required for firing. The gun's installation, initiated in May, culminated in readiness by June 5th. Notably, Gustav engaged various targets, including coastal guns, forts and ammunition depots. By the siege's conclusion on July 4th, Sevastopol lay in ruins with Gustav having fired 47 rounds and necessitating a barrel replacement. The saga of Schwerer Gustav extends to ambitious projects like the Monster, a mobile self-propelled platform that highlighted the audacious ambitions of German wartime engineering. However, limited evidence exists for this variant and the program's existence. As the tides of war turned against Germany, Schwerer Gustav faced deliberate destruction by the Germans in 1945 to prevent capture by the advancing Soviet Red Army. Despite its limited combat participation, Schwerer Gustav's colossal presence and technological prowess solidify its standing as a testament to the extremes of innovation and military engineering during World War II. The Messerschmitt Mi-262, recognized as the world's inaugural operational turbojet fighter, emerged as a game-changer in aviation development. Indeed, the Mi-262, nicknamed Schwalbe, translated to Swallow in English, in fighter versions, or Sturmvogel Stormbird in fighter-bomber versions, 
had truly remarkable specifications. This included boasting speeds of 540 miles per hour, a cruising speed of 460 miles per hour, and a range of approximately 650 miles set it apart from contemporary aircraft. With a ceiling reaching 38,000 feet and a climb rate of 3,940 feet per minute, the Mi-262, powered by two Junkers Jumo engines each producing 2,000 pounds of thrust, represented a revolutionary leap in aviation technology. Originating in April 1939, the Mi-262 faced challenges in its development, including engine issues, metallurgical concerns, and interference from high-ranking German officials like Hermann Göring and Adolf Hitler. Its maiden flight with a piston engine occurred on April 18, 1941, followed by its first jet-powered flight on July 18, 1942. Delays persisted due to various challenges, with Hitler demanding a shift from a defensive interceptor to a ground-attack bomber aircraft. Operational with the Luftwaffe in mid-1944, the Mi-262 outpaced and outgunned Allied fighters. Armed with four 30mm Mk-108 cannons, the Mi-262 had the flexibility to be modified to carry 1,000 pounds of bombs. However, its devastating impact was amplified with the development of the feared R-4M rockets. The Allies soon realized its formidable capabilities. Lieutenant General James H. Doolittle, who led the daring early war bomber raid on Tokyo, acknowledged the serious nature of the reports. The Mi-262 speed and firepower left a lasting impression, with one American pilot rendered ineffective as a leader due to the shock experienced. Despite its groundbreaking design and capabilities, the Mi-262 faced challenges that hindered its widespread impact. Only 50 were approved for combat, and at any given time, no more than 25 were operational. Engine problems, fuel shortages, and Allied attacks on airfields and manufacturing facilities contributed to the limited deployment of these advanced jets. Its top ace, Hauptmann Franz Schall, claimed 17 kills, while its speed required innovative tactics to engage Allied bombers effectively. Without a doubt, the Mi-262's groundbreaking technology set the course for the future of aviation history. The Panzerkampfwagen 8 Maus, aptly nicknamed the Maus, stands out as a remarkable feat in German World War II military engineering. Completed in late 1944, it holds the distinction of being the heaviest fully enclosed armoured fighting vehicle ever constructed, signalling an ambitious chapter in German tank design. The Maus was conceptualised as a response to the formidable Soviet heavy climate Voroshilov tank underscoring a strategic vision to counterbalance opposing military capabilities. Two prototypes underwent trials in late 1944, revealing dimensions that emphasized its imposing stature. Weighing an astounding 188 metric tons, the mouse was armed with the formidable Krupp-designed 128mm KWK 44L55 gun, renowned for its potency against all contemporary Allied armoured vehicles at ranges exceeding 3,500 metres. Navigating the logistical challenges posed by its weight, the mouse was designed for fording up to a depth of 2 metres or submerging to a depth of 8 metres, utilising a snorkel for river crossings. The emphasis on breakthrough capabilities was evident in its substantial armour. This reinforced protection aimed to render the mouse impervious to enemy fortifications while executing its role as an immense breakthrough tank. The mouse project originated in 1943, envisioning completion by mid-year and subsequent mass production at 10 units per month. Responsibilities were divided between Krupp, overseeing the chassis, armament and turret, and Alquette, handling final assembly. The V1 prototype, assembled in December 1943, initiated testing, followed by the V2 prototype's delivery in March 1944, incorporating refinements in preparation for production. However, production faced a setback in August 1944, when Krupp halted the construction of four additional mouse hulls. By September 1944, the V2 prototype commenced testing, equipped with a Daimler-Benz diesel engine, an electric steering system, and a Skoda Works-designed running gear and tracks. 
Amidst the developmental strides, logistical considerations led to the creation of a specialized railroad carriage for transporting mouse prototypes. Overall, it must be noted that the mouse had limited impact on the war. Indeed, although plans were set for five mouse tanks, only two hulls and a singular turret reached completion, a direct consequence of the testing phase being abruptly halted due to the advance of Soviet military forces. The V-1 rocket, initially developed under the codename Kirschkern, meaning cherry stone, is one of the more infamous and effective German Wunderwaffen. Its full name, the Vergeltungswaffe 1, or Vengeance Weapon 1 in English, featured an 850kg warhead and a cheap fuselage primarily made of welded sheet steel and wings crafted from plywood. Powered by a simple pulse jet engine that pulsed 50 times per second, the V-1 emitted a distinctive buzzing noise, leading to the informal nicknames Buzz Bomb and Doodle Bug. The V-1 rocket was equipped with a rudimentary autopilot system, devised by Ascania in Berlin, to regulate its altitude and airspeed. Its guidance was facilitated by a pair of gyroscopes, which controlled yaw and pitch, and its direction was maintained using a magnetic compass. To determine when the target area was reached, the V-1 utilized an odometer, driven by a vane anemometer on the nose. During flight, the airflow spun a propeller on the nose, and for every 30 rotations of this propeller, the odometer's count decreased by one. After approximately 37 miles, this mechanism also activated the warhead. When the countdown reached zero, a sequence of actions was triggered. Two detonating bolts were fired, spoilers on the elevator released, the connection between the elevator and its servo jammed, and a guillotine device severed the control hoses to the rudder servo, setting it to a neutral position. These actions caused the V-1 to enter a steep dive. Initially designed as a power dive, in practice, the dive halted the fuel flow, stopping the engine and allowing a glide to take place. The abrupt cessation of the buzzing noise served as an ominous warning to those below the flight path of the imminent impact. The German military commenced its assault on London with V-1 rockets on June 13, 1944, a strategic move influenced by the Allies' successful landing in France a week earlier. The intensity of these attacks peaked with over a hundred V-1s targeting southeast England each day. This onslaught gradually subsided as the Allies overran the launch sites, with the last one within Britain's range falling in October 1944. In the aftermath, Germany shifted its focus to Belgium, targeting the port of Antwerp and other areas with 2,448 additional V-1s. These relentless attacks continued until the final days of the war in Europe, finally ceasing with the capture of the last operational launch site in the Low Countries on March 29, 1945. In terms of future plans for the V-1, the Nazis had a few ideas that never materialized although they almost certainly would have increased their efficacy if enacted. Most notably were the Nazi plans to increase the range of the V-1 rocket from its approximate range of 150 miles, a significant limitation of its design. Plans were made, though never fully realized, to employ the Arado R-234 jet bomber as a platform for launching V-1 rockets. This strategy involved either towing the V-1s aloft attaching them beneath the wing, or carrying them in a piggyback fashion on the bomber. Utilizing the R-234 in this way would have extended the V-1's range, potentially allowing Germany to continue its assault on England even as it lost territory in Western Europe. In 1944, several test flights were conducted using this setup. However, these tests revealed a significant issue. The V-1 exhibited a porpoising effect during flight. This instability not only affected the V-1 itself, but also transferred to the carrying fighter, rendering the system too unreliable for operational use. As 1944 progressed and Germany's control over French territory diminished, the range of the V-1 rockets became insufficient to reach targets in England. While air launching was one alternative explored, the most direct solution was to extend the missile's range leading to the development of the F-1 version. In the F-1 model, the fuel tank's size was increased, which necessitated a reduction in the warhead's capacity to maintain a manageable weight. 
To further reduce weight, the nose cones and wings of the F1 variants were constructed out of wood. These modifications enabled the V1 to be launched towards London and other nearby urban centres from potential ground sites in the Netherlands. However, several factors hindered the deployment of these long-range V1s. Bombing raids on factories producing the missiles, shortages of steel and rail transport, and the chaotic tactical situation faced by Germany at this late stage of the war, all contributed to delays. As a result, only a few hundred of these extended-range F1 models ever reached their targets in England. Another alteration to the V1 intended to improve its efficacy was the V1 variant codenamed the Reichenberg. Also known as the Fiesler V103R, it was intended to be quite similar to the infamous kamikaze strategy used by the Japanese. Unlike the regular V1, the Reichenberg was to be piloted, intended to cause precise and substantial damage, most notably to enemy shipping. The strategy involved the pilot steering the aircraft close to the target and then, in the moments before impact, exiting the aircraft and parachuting to safety. The feasibility and practicality of this escape manoeuvre were highly questionable given the timing and precision required, and it was highly likely that these missions would result in the pilot's death in much the same way as the Japanese kamikaze pilots. Reportedly, the individuals selected to pilot these aircraft were to be volunteers, fully cognizant of the perilous nature of their missions. The development of these piloted V1s was plagued with issues from the start. Both the first and second flights resulted in crashes, the reasons for which went largely unexplained. Further tests involving some of Nazi Germany's most skilled testing pilots, Heinz Kenscher and Hanna Reich, also resulted in technical disaster. In part due to these technical difficulties, the Phi 103R was shelved in October 1944. And finally, in March 1945, Hitler concluded that suicide attacks were not part of the German warrior tradition, thus leading to the complete disbandment of the Reichenberg project. The V-1, although groundbreaking, held significant limitations. It had a limited range, whilst its slow speeds made it a target for Britain's anti-aircraft guns. Thus, to increase German morale and the efficacy of Germany's so-called vengeance weaponry, the V-2 was deployed toward the end of the war. Known in German as the Vergeltungswaffe II, or by its technical name the Aggregate 4, it was the world's first long-range guided ballistic missile. From a military perspective, the V-2 held several notable advantages over the V-1. First, the V-2 had a greater range than the V-1. It could travel approximately 320 kilometers or 200 miles. Second, the V-2 traveled at supersonic speeds and followed a ballistic trajectory, reaching the edge of space before descending towards its target. Thus, while the V-1 could be intercepted and shot down by Allied fighter planes and anti-aircraft guns due to its slower speed and lower altitude, the V-2, with its high-speed, high-altitude trajectory, was virtually unstoppable once launched. Nevertheless, the Nazis did not view the V-2 as a replacement for the V-1. Rather, the Nazis viewed the V-1 and V-2 as complementary weapons with different purposes. The V-1 was cheaper and easier to produce and could be used in large numbers for area bombardment, while the V-2 was a more sophisticated weapon used for specific strategic targets. Despite its technological sophistication, the V-2 rocket was not economically efficient. Its production, exorbitantly expensive even with the use of forced labour, often cost the Nazis more than the damage it inflicted in Allied territories. Nevertheless, the Nazis envisioned several enhancements to the V-2, otherwise known as the A-4, that could have significantly amplified the lethality and range of these missiles. Notably, the A-4B, the A-6 and the A-7 ballistic missiles were envisioned to incorporate gliding features similar to those of the V-1. Additionally, some reports indicate that the A-6 was considered for modification into a manned craft, potentially serving as a formidable and stealthy reconnaissance vehicle. The A-9 was designed with an approximate range of 500 miles and was equipped with a one-ton explosive payload. An anticipated addition to this system was the A-10 booster, expected to be developed by 1946. 
This booster would have extended the missile's range to over 3,000 miles, enabling strikes on the continental United States. American intelligence sources indicated that the addition of the A-11 and A-12 boosters represented the ultimate evolution of this missile system. These boosters, serving as the first and second stages of a four-stage rocket system that also included the A-9 and A-10, would have provided sufficient thrust to place approximately 10 tons of explosives into low Earth orbit. This capability would have allowed for potentially devastating strikes anywhere on the planet within a very short time frame. Plans for supersonic and hypersonic weaponry also extended to bomber craft. However, these designs were largely fanciful and almost impossible with 1940s technology. A great example of this is the Silbervogel, otherwise known as the Silverbird or rocket bomber. This was a planned intercontinental orbital bomber designed to strike at the Reich's enemies in the USA. The mission of the Silbervogel was designed to commence with the bomber being propelled along a two-mile-long rail track by a rocket-powered sled, accelerating to a speed of around 1,200 miles per hour. Upon becoming airborne, the aircraft was to activate its own rocket engine, further ascending to an altitude of 90 miles while achieving velocities near 13,500 miles per hour. It was calculated that the aircraft could deliver a 4,000-kilogram bomb to the continental United States and then continue its flight towards a landing site in the Pacific region controlled by the Empire of Japan, covering a total distance of 19,000 to 24,000 kilometers. Although the Silbervogel was dismissed by the Nazis as far-fetched, the proposed design caused great excitement in the post-war Soviet Union. According to numerous sources, Josef Stalin was so enamored by the thought of this hypersonic bomber that he allegedly sent his own son to go and capture the scientist who designed the Silbervogel, although this apparently failed. However, the Soviet Union's enthusiasm for the Silbervogel might have been misplaced. To date, no hypersonic bombers capable of reaching the Silbervogel's proposed speeds have been developed. The mathematics underpinning the design were apparently significantly flawed. Given the intense heat associated with hypersonic speeds, it's likely that the Silbervogel would have succumbed to structural failure due to overheating, rendering this ambitious project rather impractical and likely doomed to failure. The Messerschmitt Comet stands as a pivotal example of rocket-powered interceptor aircraft designed and manufactured by the prominent German aviation company Messerschmitt. This singular operational rocket-powered fighter holds the distinction of being the first piloted aircraft globally to surpass the speed of 1,000 km per hour in level flight. The Germans called the Comet the Devil's Broomstick for the incredible speed with which it reached its altitude of 30,000 feet. Initiated in 1937, the Comet's development traces its roots to the work of German aeronautical engineer Alexander Lippisch. Originally an experimental program, merging traditional glider designs with groundbreaking elements such as the rocket engine. Its progress faced organizational challenges until Lippisch and his team joined Messerschmitt. In January 1939, the envisioned propeller-powered intermediary aircraft was swiftly abandoned in favor of direct progression to rocket propulsion. The prototype's maiden flight on September 1, 1941, showcased unprecedented performance, prompting swift Nazi initiatives for widespread deployment. In early July 1944, German test pilot Heine Dittmar achieved an unofficial flight airspeed record of 1,130 km per hour, a speed unrivaled by turbojet-powered aircraft until 1953. Operational missions commenced later that year, primarily tasked with defending against incoming enemy bombing raids. By war's end, around 370 comets had been produced, with operational deployment being the primary use. Yet, the Comet faced challenges, including a limited 7.5-minute powered flight duration, falling short of projections. During initial combat engagements with the Allied bombers, German pilots noticed that the Comet's armament had a huge flaw. The weapons were difficult to use with the standard attack tactics of the aircraft. This involved getting the Comet high above the Allied bombers and then plunging down at them with a dive speed of 930 km per hour. 
Due to its main cannon's low velocity, and in order to avoid collision with the target, the pilot had only a few seconds available to engage the enemy. This meant that only the highly experienced Comet pilots had a chance of hitting the enemy aircraft. This contributed to the Comet, despite achieving operational status as a dedicated interceptor, having a track record somewhat underwhelming, only credited with destroying between 9 and 18 Allied aircraft against 10 losses. Beyond combat, numerous pilots faced fatalities during testing and training flights. The high loss rate, partially attributed to the later model's volatile and corrosive rocket propellant, contributed to operational shortcomings. Joseph Pers, a notable German fighter ace, succumbed to exposure to T-Stoff and injuries during a failed takeoff in 1943, exemplifying the hazards associated with the propulsion system. Remarkably post-World War II, neither the Comet nor rocket planes in general found operational use by any nation besides Nazi Germany. Although a few captured Comets were flown for evaluation and research, the aircraft's limited success in combat and inherent challenges tempered its enduring influence on subsequent aviation developments. Concluding this video on the Third Reich's more outlandish endeavours, we turn our attention to three particularly fanciful projects – the artificial tornado vortex cannon, the wind cannon and the sun gun. First, we have the artificial tornado vortex cannon. Operating by igniting gas in a large tube, it would then release high temperature and high pressure gas through a rotating nozzle into the atmosphere, subsequently generating an artificial tornado. This device was reportedly capable of creating mini tornadoes up to 300 meters high, demonstrating its ability to destroy wooden sheds from a distance of 150 meters. However, its limited range and accuracy rendered it ineffective, leading to minimal interest from the German army. Similarly, the wind cannon functioned by discharging small, intense bursts of rapidly rotating gas. These mini vortexes were propelled by a powerful explosion, releasing a projectile of compressed air and water vapor. This had the impact of a small shell, as evidenced by experiments at Hillesleben, where a 25 mm thick wooden board was shattered at 200 meters. Despite these successes, the wind cannon's effectiveness was drastically reduced in windy conditions and at greater distances. Additionally, the aerodynamic design of fighter planes diminished the weapon's potential, proving lethal only at specific angles of impact. Consequently, these air-based weapons were deemed impractical and not pursued on a large scale. The final noteworthy Wunderwaffen is the Sonnengewehr, or Sun Gun, this weapon was designed to use a vast, 3.5-square-mile mirror in space, positioned 5,000 miles above Earth, to concentrate the sun's rays on specific terrestrial targets. The principle was akin to using a magnifying glass to focus sunlight into a searing point, but magnified to a vastly more destructive degree. German scientists working on this project acknowledged it wouldn't be feasible for another 50 to 100 years, a recognition of its immense scale and complexity. So, although it likely was not planned to be used during World War II, it may have potentially been used in a planned future war against Japan in a hypothetical Axis victory, a topic we discussed in more depth in this video. These weapons fed into the overall myth of the Nazis' so-called wonder weapons. Indeed, Germany did not possess a comprehensive technological advantage during World War II. What they did have were a series of ostentatious prestige projects that were hastily pushed into accelerated development and production without adequate refinement of their designs. While these projects could be formidable weapons when everything worked perfectly, the reality of war meant that things rarely went according to plan. Many of the so-called German superweapons suffered from persistent flaws, significantly diminishing their effectiveness compared to their theoretical capabilities. In several instances, the Allied powers had access to similar technology, but refrained from risking unproven designs, as they were already achieving success with established and reliable equipment. The German desperation for a game-changing advantage led them to take shortcuts that the Allies deemed unacceptable. This desperation may give the impression of substantial technological prowess, but a closer examination reveals that the presumed technical advantages of the Germans were often illusory. What often gets overlooked in discussions praising German technology 
is the realization that designing and building a weapon is not a purely abstract exercise. It is easy to become engrossed in meticulous technical specifications, such as nominal horsepower, armor or penetration values, at the expense of understanding the weapon's intended purpose, its operational use, and its capability to fulfill assigned tasks. Moreover, even if a weapon boasts unparalleled strength and reliability, if it is excessively expensive and time-consuming to manufacture and overshadows other projects, it can be deemed a failure. While theorizing and innovation are essential, the ultimate objective of any design process must be to create something that not only functions as intended, but can also be mass-produced to have a significant impact. This is particularly crucial in the context of war, where the effectiveness of a weapon is a matter of life and death. The ultimate weapon of death, the atomic bomb, is a pronounced example of this myth of Nazi supremacy in science. Indeed, the Nazis were never remotely close to developing the nuclear bomb. Regardless of the abundant evidence, the majority continue to believe the opposite, as revealed by our polls on the topic. As such, if you wish to truly differentiate fact from fiction, we encourage you to watch our videos on the subject. And as always, thanks for watching.